where, where you, you got so many things on your plate and, and not enough time to get accomplished. And we feel that if we just keep on going, we'll get it accomplished. For me, when I don't take a day off, you know what? I tend to forget a lot. How many of you are the same way? Um, when you're working, you, you misplace things, you put something down, and you do something else, and then you come back, you go, where did I put that? How many of you have done that before? <laughs> and it takes forever to find it, but you know what? If you are real well rested, then your mind is clear, and you will remember more. It's some kind of principle there that I think we miss sometimes in life, right? But yet we think that we can, we know better than God, that we can just do whatever we want to and things are going to be okay. And it says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in it and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh Sabbath day and made it holy. Now I know a lot of people have different thoughts about why we as Christians don't observe the Sabbath. And, and I was the same way for a long time, but I decided that I need to, I was going to try it. I'm going to see what happens if I take the Sabbath off. And you know what? Things have been going a lot better for me when I have taken some time for myself and not think that I could work an extra day to get it done. You know what? I don't know where you're at with this, but test it. See what happens. Take the Sabbath off, and, and that's one thing that a lot of people misunderstood stand too, is they think that because in the New Testament we worship on Sunday, then that is the Sabbath. You know what? The Sabbath was never changed. I mean, if I'm wrong, and you, you can show me a scripture verse that says, that the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday, I want you to show it to me, but I have never found that. The Sabbath is always the Sabbath. And maybe it's the reason is that, that now that we worship on the Sunday and we were well rested and preparing our hearts to hear God's word, then we come together on Sunday and we can have this fellowship, we can have love for each other, we can honor the Lord, with all we got, because we're ready to receive what he wants to teach us. Honor your father and your mother. <laughs> when I look at our society today, do you, do you see honor and respect among the kids, among their parents? No. I remember that if I disrespected my parents, <laughs> I found out really quickly that's not the right thing to do. And, and we're, we're growing a society that we're not teaching kids respect. Why is this so important? To honor your parents. And it, I think it's the authority structure in the home. And when you remove authority, the family is the base of society. And when you remove the authority of the home, you are tearing down the, the base of society. And so what is happening among our homes today? We have a lot of separation. We have divorce. We have kids rebelling. We have parents that are treating their kids badly. And then what happens? Society falls apart. Because we don't follow this commandment to honor our fathers and our mothers. And there's a statement that goes along with that, that, that there's results of blessing if you follow this commandment, 
It says that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. Now, now here's one that a lot of people misunderstand too, because you know, people say, well, since you shall not murder, I will not take up a gun and go to war. <clears throat> or even to the point where, you know, they say, well, the Ten Commandments says you cannot kill, so we will not go hunting and shoot an animal because that's murdering. Well, look at Scripture, right? How else are you going to eat meat if you don't kill that animal? I mean, all through Scriptures, the, the Old Testament talks about you know, the offerings. You slaughter the animal and you make the offering before the Lord. Well, how do you reconcile that you're not supposed to murder or you're not supposed to kill and, and God tells you to kill? In fact, the one part that I had trouble with when I was younger, uh, reading the scriptures about God saying that when you go into the land, do what? Kill Men, women, children, cattle, everything, annihilate them, genocide, wipe them out. Now, th that doesn't sound like following you shall not murder. Well, what's the principle behind that? Corruption. God knew that if the Israelites, the Hebrew people, when they went into the land, which they didn't listen to God, right? They intermarried with those people. They started worshiping. They, they started worshiping the idols of their spouses. And they got corrupted. That's how he ended up with the Samaritans, right? They, they intermarried and then they started worshiping the other gods. There's a principle that's behind it. You shall not commit adultery. Again, you go back to one of the foundations of the home, right? Yet today, you, every single one of us knows somebody that has been in an adulterous relationship. And sometimes it's even encouraged and praised among our community. Why? Why does God say that we should not commit adultery. Well, it, it has a lot of things. It, it destroys their home. It destroys relationships. It doesn't only destroy the, the relationship between the couple, but there's the other people on the surrounding relationships, the parents, the kids. There's so much that is involved when this law is not obeyed. You shall not steal. You know what? <laughs> a simple, simple law, commandment, and yet it's also a simple one to break. Yeah, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't steal cars, I don't steal cattle. But how many of us make excuses when we um, take a little paper clip that doesn't belong to us. Is that stealing? Is anybody going to miss a paper clip? That's between you and God, right? Can you live with that? And sometimes we have been so hardened with this idea of what's right and what is wrong that we don't even, we're not even phased when we're doing something that is wrong, and we make excuses to say and justify that it's okay. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now that's a long phrase, right? For uh, you shouldn't lie. You know what? Sometimes one disobedience to the commandment leads to another. When you steal something and then someone catches you and you say, no, I didn't do that. 
that person did it, right? To cover up what you did wrong. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. I don't know, that's one that might be hard for some of you. When you are not content with what you got, it causes this feeling of, well, I wish I had that. I mean, how many times when somebody, a neighbor, parks a brand new car in the yard and you go, wow, hmm, maybe it's time for me to go and look for a better car. I don't know, just when we got our new van, somebody came along and keyed it. Why did they do that? Were they jealous that we got a new vehicle? I don't know. But you see how the heart can be hardened to what the truth is? And when we start wanting something that doesn't belong to us, he says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When I think about all the yard sales, it happens all the time. You know? Get some things from people that they don't want anymore, right? Is that wrong? Well, it's only between you and God, right? If you're coveting something, that comes from right here. It doesn't matter if you pay for it or not. It's just wanting something, really, and you'll do anything to get it. It doesn't matter if you pay for it or not. It's the desire in the heart. Is there something that you're desiring that doesn't belong to you, and you'll do anything you want to get it? <clears throat> And then we go into the New Testament. Now you have read this passage before, right? Where it talks about the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost had come, and they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came a, came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. I don't know if it was like a tornado. How many of you have ever been near a tornado? and heard the sound of the tornado. Maybe that's what it was like. And it filled the whole house they were, where they were sitting. So this must have been a spectacular event that happened. <laughs> that word, pneuma. that's where we get the word pneumonia, which has to do with the lungs, right? The spirit. <laughs> Can you imagine? And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving, giving them utterance. And then it quotes the scripture verse, verse 17, from Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will grant wonders in the skies above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned, darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, it's really interesting that in my lifetime, in your lifetime, some interesting signs in the heavens are happening. 
I mean, how many of you watched the eclipse this year? This last year? Was it last year? <laughs> or the, the moon, the lunar eclipse. All these things are happening. And it seems like we are actually watching these things happen right before our eyes. We see some things happening within the world today that point to the coming of Christ. Is he going to come in our lifetime? Scripture says no one knows the time when he's going to return. But the question is, have you received the law of God and planted in your hearts and allow the Holy Spirit to dwell within you and you're living the law? By the way your character is. You see, all the law is is God showing his character to you. If you obey my commandments, you are becoming like me. You're allowing the word of God, the Holy Spirit to live within you and become alive in you. And you shall be my witness. You shall be my witnesses. When you allow the Holy Spirit to live in you, you are going to be the ones that proclaim to the world that I live. And other people will come to know who Jesus Christ is because of the Holy Spirit living. And you know what? Jesus says, you will do mightier things than I have if you allow the power of the Holy Spirit to move through you. Because if God has purposed you with a gift, and that's not it. If you're a Christian, God has given you a gift to proclaim His name <coughs> the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the hymn of invitation is, burdens are lifted at Calvary.